Can you hear that? It's the symphony of frogs, insects, birds, and even alligators that call this place home. This area is full of interesting plants and animals, but what do they all have in common? And how have they adapted to live here? Let's find out together in this episode all about the wetlands. A wetland is an area of land that is either covered by water or saturated with water. They are transition zones, never totally dry land, but also not totally underwater. They have characteristics of both. It's complicated. Because of this combination of land and water, wetlands are home to a wide variety of organisms and are found in many places on Earth. A biome is a region defined by a specific climate and the plants and animals who have adapted to live there. Wetlands are unique. They can be found from the equator to the polar regions and unlike other biomes are much less influenced by climate. The presence of shallow, undisturbed water is really the determining factor, which makes sense. Wet land. So where is this water coming from? The water is often groundwater seeping up from an aquifer or spring, but water can also come from a nearby river or lake. Seawater can also create wetlands, especially in coastal areas that experience strong tides. Some wetlands are flooded woodlands, still full of trees. Others are more like flat, watery grasslands. It's really just this combination of both land and water that is essential for this ecosystem to form. Wetlands have a ton of other names, but scientists consider swamps, marshes, and bogs to be the three major types of wetlands. A swamp is a wetland permanently saturated with water and dominated by trees. There are freshwater swamps and saltwater swamps. Freshwater swamps are commonly found in tropical areas near the equator and usually experience year-round heat and humidity. Tell me about it. Freshwater swamps like this one often form on flat land around lakes or streams where runoff is sluggish and the water table is high. Runoff is water that flows over the ground surface and ultimately drains into bodies of water like rivers, lakes, and oceans. And the water table is an underground boundary between the soil surface and the area where groundwater saturates spaces between sediments and cracks and rocks. So you can see why all this extra water is hanging out up here. Seasonal flooding and rainwater add more water to these swamps, so the water level is constantly fluctuating. You can actually observe this here on this cypress tree. The water level was up here at this mark, and now it's currently down at this level. Cypress swamps are common throughout the United States. The bayous here in the state of Louisiana, near slow-moving parts of the Mississippi River, are considered the most famous American swamplands. Along with cypress, you will find other water-tolerant plants, such as cattails and lotus, growing in the swamp's wet soil. Wetland plants are called hydrophytes because they are uniquely adapted to their watery soil. You can often find tiny water plants called duckweed, forming a green covering on the surface of the water, giving it that swampy look. Reptiles and amphibians thrive in freshwater swamps because they are adapted to the fluctuating water levels. It's common to spot alligators and several species of snakes, like this water moccasin, swimming among the plants. Frogs can be seen at the water's edge or hanging out on a dancing reed or tree trunk. Crawfish, shrimp, and fish, such as catfish, are living under the water, and they attract the species of wading birds that are native to the bayou. Saltwater swamps are typically found along tropical coastlines. The brackish water of saltwater swamps isn't entirely seawater, but isn't entirely freshwater either. These areas form where water from a river or stream meets ocean water, like here in this estuary located on Florida's coast. The mangrove trees behind me dominate this estuary because of their ability to tolerate brackish water. Mangroves are easy to recognize because of their tall, stilt-like roots, which hold the small trunks and branches of the trees above water. Mangrove roots create a sort of micro-ecosystem, providing shelter and a place to consume fallen leaves and other materials for small fish, crabs, and other shellfish. Seabirds, such as gulls, as well as freshwater birds, such as herons, hang out here to snack on the crabs. Storks, ibises, and herons nest in the high branches of mangrove trees. Under the water, you will find shrimp, carp, grays, eels, 
and crabs. Reptiles and amphibians live close to the water's edge, including frogs, toads, turtles, and snakes. If you're still here liking this video, let us know and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Moving north and south of the tropics, these swamps give way to marshes. Marshes form in flat areas, along lakes, mouths of rivers, and along coastlines, and are dominated by grasses and aquatic plants. Many freshwater marshes lie in the prairie pothole region of North America. It's a strange name, but prairie potholes are what they sound like bowl-shaped depressions filled with water. These depressions were left by chunks of glacial ice buried in the soil during the most recent ice age. When this ice melted, the muddy water that was left behind filled the potholes. Thousands of migratory birds depend on the remaining prairie potholes as they travel from the Arctic to more temperate climates every year. And many species of waterfowl use these wetlands as breeding areas. Farther south, freshwater marshes form much of the Everglades, a huge wetland region in southern Florida. Water from Lake Okeechobee flows slowly through here in the Everglades on its way to the ocean. The Everglades is a diverse ecosystem that contains hundreds of species of wading birds. Can you hear some of them? Each specifically adapted to feed on either insects or fish, shrimp, clams, or even mice. You may spot alligators making their nests in the dense sawgrass or swimming in the murky water. Deer and raccoons live in the dry areas of the marsh, while river otters make their homes among the tree roots. The Everglades supports a significant number of endangered species, including the Florida panther, West Indian manatee, snail kite, and American crocodile. While swamps and marshes are generally found in warm climates, bogs can also be found in cold areas in North America, Europe, and Asia. Like in our other wetland types, bogs develop in areas where the water table or upper surface of underground water is high. They often begin in glacial depressions called kettle lakes. It's the same idea as the prairie potholes we've already covered, but are deeper. A bog forms as a kettle lake, gradually fills with plant debris, such as stems, leaves, and roots. Soon mosses and other plants begin growing along the edges of the lake, extending into the water, causing the water to become choked with vegetation. Unlike other wetlands, bogs are usually not fertile, due to the large amount of acid and low amount of nutrients, especially nitrogen in the soil. Because of this, only certain kinds of plants can grow in bogs. Plants are autotrophs, meaning that they can create their own food from air, water, and sunlight. Many bog plants have adapted to the poor nutrients in the soil and water by turning to another food source, like these pitcher plants found in Big Thicket National Preserve in South Texas. These pitcher plants are carnivorous. They trap and consume insects. This deep basin is actually a modified leaf structure filled with digestive enzymes. Insects venture in looking for food, drawn to the pitcher's coloration and alluring scent, just like they are with flowering plants. Eventually, it falls down the funnel into that pool of liquid enzymes and drowns. Those enzymes slowly begin to break its body down into microscopic particles the pitcher plant can consume through its leaves. That's rough. These are sundews. The leaves here are covered in thin, wispy hairs, each with a tiny drop of liquid at the end. Thinking the liquid is actually nectar, insects fly in for a snack. Those dewdrops are actually mucilage, a sticky trap for the insect. The sundew take it a step further, and those wispy tentacles move to curl around the insect, holding it tightly and maximizing the amount of hairs that it touches, which speeds up digestion. Wetlands are some of the most valuable ecosystems on Earth, but in the not-so-distant past, wetlands were regarded as wastelands. Wetlands were thought of as places to be avoided, so people would drain them, fill them in, and treat them as dumping grounds. In fact, more than half of the wetlands that have existed in the lower 48 states of the U.S. have been destroyed 
Fortunately, now we know better and have discovered that wetlands are not only home to diverse and endangered wildlife, but also hold important ecological significance. Wetlands act like giant sponges or reservoirs, absorbing excess water during heavy rains, limiting the effects of flooding. They slowly release stored water over time, helping to keep streams flowing during times of drought. They are natural water purifiers, filtering sediments and absorbing many surface water pollutants. The mangrove forests in South Florida reduce flooding and property damage during major storms. Without wetlands, we would lose many of the plant and animal species that we've just learned about, and the surrounding ecosystems would suffer. There's a link somewhere down there with more information on how you can help the North American wetlands. And if you want to learn more science, you can check out this video next. storm is coming in. Do you see it right here? It's a blowing this way. Gonna get more water in the wetlands. Real excited about it.